Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, as you just mentioned, I work on black holes on many scales. It's a very challenging problem for us theoretically due to the enormous dynamic range uh, that is relevant for this problem. Uh, so I'm a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration uh, where we're studying in the smaller scales, observationally accessible, how black holes uh, are accreting their matter and imparting feedback onto the surroundings. And with cosmological simulations and semi-analytic models as well, if I have time to get to that, uh, I study the connection between black holes and their galaxies over cosmic time and on larger scales. So we believe that uh, most massive galaxies host a supermassive black hole at their center. The best evidence of uh, these massive black holes comes from the center of our own galaxy, where we've been able to track the orbits of individual stars for decades now uh, around this uh, object Sag A star. This is an animation from the UCLA Galactic Center Group. And also from M87, where we've now directly imaged a supermassive black hole. Uh, its shadow uh, silhouetted against this uh, ring of orbiting hot gas. Using many other dynamical techniques, black hole masses have been inferred in many other galaxies. And we found that they correlate with galaxy properties on much larger scales than they're able to directly influence. This is a, a plot from a nice review paper from Cormody and Ho 2013. And you can see this uh, nice relationship where the mass of the black hole goes as the velocity dispersion of the bulge component of the galaxy uh, to about the fifth power here. And it's somewhere between four and five sometimes up to up to six, depending on which objects you include in your, in your uh, compilation. And uh, these are galactic structures that span kiloparsecs in scale, much larger than the black hole directly gravitationally influences, suggesting that black holes and their host galaxies co-evolve in some way. But the details of this relationship are very poorly understood and arguably the most uncertain aspect of galaxy formation astrophysics at the, at, at the moment. And so we'd like to know how massive black holes assemble and uh, how this assembly affects our cosmic origin story and uh, the assembly of, of galaxies overall. And I'd like to split up this question into uh, four different themes when I'm thinking about it. Uh, the seeding, growth, feedback, and dynamics of supermassive black holes. So first, uh, briefly introducing these, uh, the seeding problem is how did the very first black holes that grow up to be supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies uh, come to being. And uh, we often compare and contrast two extreme scenarios, light common seeds, which may come from the remnants of just the very first massive population three stars, which uh, will leave behind a black hole, uh, versus heavy and rare seeds, which uh, may originate from the direct collapse of uh, a monolithic gas cloud in special conditions that would cause it to avoid fragmenting into stars as a um, big cloud like that usually would. Um, this is done by uh, usually invoking an external radiation field to uh, prevent the formation of molecular hydrogen, uh, as well as uh, a very pristine gas so that metal cooling isn't, uh, isn't possible. Uh, now these light seeds, uh, uh, we know how the universe can create them uh, just by producing uh, massive stars and having them evolve. Uh, but these in, theoretically have problems growing efficiently. And the biggest problem for these is the fact that at redshifts of six and seven, when the universe is um, less than a gig year old, we're already seeing 10 to the nine solar mass black holes powering quasars at this epoch, uh, which would require very efficient accretion. Uh, and so the direct collapse scenario is uh, one potential way uh, to alleviate this problem somewhat um, by allowing you to start off with a seed that's orders of magnitude more massive. But this only gets you to about uh, 10 to the six solar masses if you're generous. Uh, black holes still need to grow by several orders of magnitude. And we believe that uh, this occurs mostly through uh, gas accretion uh, onto the black holes as transported from their galaxies over cosmic time. One way that you can do that is uh, by having a mer major merger of two galaxies. Uh, this is a simulation by Di Matteo, Springle, and Hernquist. You're looking at uh, gas temperature here. And uh, you've started out with uh, two uh, gas disks and an equal mass merger. The gas collides with itself to lose angular momentum, which funnels uh, towards the center, fueling black holes, uh, which you can't see here, but uh, which are accreting and uh, imparting feedback energy into their surroundings. And you can see that in action now. 
Uh, in this case, it was a pure uh, thermal dump of energy uh, into the surrounding uh, material, uh, which is blowing out the gas here. And we believe that feedback processes, something like this, uh, are important for producing quenched massive elliptical galaxies uh, in halos more massive than the Milky Way. Uh, this particular feedback scheme is, is pretty dramatic uh, for, for uh, today. And you can see has uh, largely blown away uh, the gas here. It also doesn't have uh, a jet, uh, which we see in many AGN. Um, and uh, exactly how we implement these, these schemes for both the accretion and feedback is an ongoing area of challenging research. Uh, and uh, here's an example of uh, a galaxy with this uh, very obvious and dramatic jet, 3C348. Uh, and uh, it's blowing out these, uh, these jets that are stretching a million light years in either direction. It's believed that AGN feedback is essential for regulating gas cooling. And you can, for example, uh, look at uh, the energy required to inflate these lobes and uh, compare that with uh, the jet power. And it seems that these that AGN feedback in this form is responsible for uh, preventing the overcooling of gas in clusters. Finally, there's the question of dynamics. We know that galaxies merge uh, in the Lambda CDM paradigm. And so uh, it stands to reason that a binary black hole could potentially form if they're able to complete a journey across many orders of magnitude in spatial scale as well. Now, this can produce uh, observable gravitational wave events that we hope to detect uh, with LISA and pulsar timing arrays. And they may even actually be a significant growth channel for especially the most massive black holes, which I'll get back to later. Uh, recently, uh, there's been work searching for wandering black holes uh, in the uh, in the halos of galaxies, those which fail to merge. And uh, there's, there was this interesting data set from uh, Amy Rines, who looked for radio AGN candidates in dwarf galaxies, finding that many of them were offset from their centers. And uh, potentially, this could have some impact on whether or not they actually affect the evolution of uh, galaxies in the dwarf regime. As I've mentioned, the challenge here is this enormous dynamic range in, in spatial and temporal scale. And so uh, many of us theorists uh, use completely different codes and techniques to hone in on different aspects of this problem. On the smaller scales, we've got uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations, which we can use and compare to event horizon telescope data uh, to study accretion and feedback. But we need to connect this to processes happening on galactic scales um, and uh, how galaxies and potentially even the intergalactic environment uh, could affect how gas is funneled and uh, fueling these black holes. Uh, I focused my work uh, in the past uh, uh, decade or so on these two uh, extreme ends here. And uh, I'll be telling you first about uh, event horizon scale stuff and then uh, cosmological scale stuff. Uh, so we're going to begin here with uh, studies of the central engine, uh, where uh, we're looking in the central, uh, perhaps 100 to 1,000 gravitational radii, if you're generous, um, with imaging with the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, how one can connect black holes to the evolution of galaxies and uh, this, these uh, Romulus cosmological simulations that I like to use. Uh, and then if I have time, uh, I'll talk about uh, semi-analytic modeling, how one might put this all together uh, to extrapolate to very large effective volumes and uh, high, high effective uh, resolution uh, to make samples uh, for uh, appropriate for the entire observable universe. So first we'll start off with the central engine. Here's a nice zoom in on M87 uh, created by NASA. And uh, the scale bar you just saw was 100,000 light years. And uh, this really, I think, uh, uh, illustrates the, the challenge that we have as theorists to uh, properly uh, model all of these scales. As we zoom in, we'll, we're going to be looking through different telescopes. Already, we've reached the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see this prominent jet that is being launched from the center where we believe there is a supermassive black hole. Uh, as we go closer and closer in, the only techniques that are able to provide images of such resolution are going to be uh, very long baseline interferometry. That is uh, uh, radio interferometry where the dishes are spaced a significant distance apart 
uh, here already on continent scale um, uh, observatories until eventually we'll finally make it down to the uh, event horizon telescope image, which was created in the millimeter, requiring a telescope effectively the size of the Earth. And uh, here it is. I'm, you've probably seen this before, probably at uh, better resolution than the TV can provide. Uh, and now you can see this, this scale down here is down at uh, 0.01 light years, uh, about the solar system size scales, where you would typically find uh, in a galaxy only one star. Like I said, this image uh, required a global telescope array. Uh, this is the Event Horizon Telescope uh, as, as it observed M87 and Sag A star in 2017. And uh, our collaboration contains hundreds of members that are all working hard to uh, analyze these data, uh, produce images, and uh, do the theoretical comparisons. Um, and uh, we're working hard on, on Sag A star, uh, which of course, uh, will be uh, the other main target uh, for which we will have created an image. If you're up to date on your black hole news, you know this isn't the latest image, uh, but rather it is this one. Um, I think pr probably the people on Zoom can see it better, but uh, there are some streaks here which are trying to illustrate the linear polarization uh, of this black hole. Um, and this gives us insights into the strength and also geometry of the magnetic field. Uh, so I'm part of uh, the theory working groups in, in the uh, uh, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And I'll tell you a bit about how we make these theoretical models and uh, connect the uh, accretion flow to the observables. So the picture I always evoke in my head uh, when thinking about these abstractly is, is this for an, for an AGN. We've got an accretion disk, uh, which will sometimes launch this uh, relativistic jet that you can see on very large scales. Uh, and then uh, the event horizon there is shown. Uh, in this case, the accretion disk is, is thin and uh, going all the way, uh, or at least nearly all the way down to the horizon. The theory version of that is this, a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics or GRMHD simulation. And uh, this is a movie made by Hotaka Shiokawa. You're looking at uh, the gas uh, uh, in the disk in orange and in the jet in white. And uh, the ribbons here are visualizing the magnetic field lines. So you can see there are some uh, uh, turbulent tangled ones in the disk and uh, straighter and uh, um, um, straighter ones that are uh, going through the jet that are anchored onto the black hole in this case. What I focus on primarily in the EHT is doing the general relativistic radiative transfer or ray tracing, either way GRRT. And this image uh, has some interesting dissimilarities compared to what you see on the left here. Uh, first Doppler beaming is making the left side brighter than the, than the right side. This means that the asymmetry in the M87 image tells us uh, which way the gas is rotating. Um, next there, there's of course the image of the black hole shadow. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what we call the lensed image of the event horizon. Uh, if you shot a null geodesic from the camera uh, into that region, it plunges into the black hole. And then there's this uh, interesting, nearly uh, perfectly circular and still ring that we call the photon ring. And this is because there is an unstable orbit uh, around the black hole uh, where light can go around and around in short shield. This, this is located at 3M. Uh, and eventually the light rays will either plunge into the black hole or shoot out to infinity where we would observe it as this ring. Now, one of the- Are of those two images the same in some sense? Or... Uh, no, the, the left one was a uh, much larger field of view than the right. Um, but- uh, how, how much, like the, the material that you're actually seeing in the right image, where is it coming from in the, in the left image? Uh, I don't know, so I don't know exactly. I would, but this should come from uh, very near the horizon in this case. So it's really- Yeah, so- yeah, so the image of the event horizon, the shadow, uh, subtends uh, about 5M. Um, and uh, this emission is coming from very nearby. And, and in the left, whatever they plotted dark is the size of M. Uh, it sh yeah, it should be 2M, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
One of the main drivers of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, was to distinguish two classes of, of accretion disks uh, that are characterized by different magnetic field structures. Uh, and here's a visualization that I made recently uh, where you're looking uh, at the radial um, azimuthal and vertical components of the magnetic field after an azimuthal average uh, for two classes of models. On the left, uh, we've got something that looks pretty ordered and uh, turns out to be dynamically important as well. And on the right, we have something disordered and dynamically unimportant. These have my favorite acronyms in all of astronomy, a magnetically arrested disk or a MAD versus standard and normal evolution or a SANE. So uh, determining the relative insanity of these black holes uh, has been a, a major goal. Um, so on the, on the right, we have a field that's more turbulent. The field is basically just going with the flow of the turbulent uh, accretion. Turns out to also have uh, much more of a uh, azimuthal uh, component, whereas uh, it's the mad uh, accretion flows that tend to have more of uh, the toroidal component, that is a combination of vertical and radial fields. You just had seen this movie, you would name them the other way around. Or what? <laughs> yeah. the, the one that looks very ordered, you're calling it mad. And the one that looks crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't know. It was for the acronym, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, polarization encodes uh, the plasma properties in an interesting way. And uh, in my opinion, has, uh, uh, is much more useful for constraining models than just the total intensity image. Uh, so in the millimeter, what we observe is synchrotron radiation, and this has a very large intrinsic linear polarization fraction. And when synchrotron is emitted, the polarization ticks are oriented perpendicular to the local magnetic field. So if nothing else was happening, uh, this would directly tell you about the geometry. It turns out uh, that in simulated images of these MADs and SANES, MADs look twistier in polarization than SANES do. This is a, a plot from Palumbo, Wong, and Prather, 2020. Uh, George is in the corner over there, uh, the middle author. And uh, you can see that uh, in the blurred mag, we have this pinwheel shape, uh, whereas the blurred sane has more of a, a radial uh, shape for the magnetic field ticks. Now, the reason that this happens uh, is uh, easy to understand if you just think about the geometry. Uh, so this is a, a simple animation that, uh, oops, sorry, uh, that we helped, uh, that we made with Crazy Bridge Studios. Uh, so for M87, an important thing to know is we're looking at it relatively face on. The inclination angle is we think about 17 degrees. Uh, and so suppose we have a magnetic field structure that's uh, completely toroidal in this case. Then uh, as the light is moving from the structure to us, since we're looking at it face on, ticks have to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, you'll end up with this radial pattern, uh, which is similar to the same that we saw before. On the other hand, uh, if you, uh, in the mad case, they tend to have more of a poloidal field, like I said, and uh, in this idealization, it's entirely cylindrically radial. Uh, in this case, you'll end up uh, with uh, concentric circles for the pattern instead. If you want something that looks like M87, you need something in between, a mix of, of radial and toroidal, and uh, you'll end up with a twisty pattern with the opposite handedness. Uh, now, this is, of course, a big simplification, swept a lot of details under the rug, including the role of the vertical field, light bending effects, and uh, perhaps most importantly, Faraday rotation. Um, but this should give you some idea of how we're, we're sensitive to the geometry of the magnetic field when we look at uh, the morphology of these linear polarization ticks. To do it correctly, uh, we uh, confronted the data uh, with an enormous library of simulations, 72,000 simulated images originating from uh, several uh, GRMHD simulations. We decided on a few different uh, important parameters that we wanted to consider to score images, the net linear polarization fraction uh, which is distinct from the average on resolved scales, uh, the circular polarization fraction for which there is at present only an upper limit for M87, and uh, this parameter beta 2, which encapsulates the twistiness of linear polarization. Uh, in the simulations, we looked at both MADs and SANES, uh, five different spin values, um, and 12 different electron temperature prescriptions. Uh, 
something we call R high and R low, uh, if you're familiar with this. Uh, but this sets the ratio of the ion to electron temperatures as a function of plasma beta in these simulations, which we, we treat as a free parameter with this particular prescription. Well, were those betas uh, uh, defined based on some heuristical thing, or was it in some sense uh, what made, like something that captured how these things differ? Or was some sort of uh, ordering of what uh, gives you the information, or it's just because it makes sense, just heuristically? Uh, you, you mean these betas? Yes. Um, so th this is the um, azimuthally symmetric mode of, uh, of linear polarization in the image. And uh, yeah, it, it will t the argument of this will tell you whether the, the ticks are wrapping around uh, in a circle versus radial. Uh, George, if you want to jump in. So the, the motivation was kind of to do a, a Fourier transform um, in some reasonable basis. So you expect some symmetry, some, some, some symmetry around the image. Um, and it, it, if you do a Fourier transform of that, you get a complete in principle representation. Um, and then just heuristically, everything looks like it's ordered in this, it has a circular symmetry. Um, and that corresponds to the second component. So it's the beta sub two component. Um, and then uh, in, in that PWP paper, we did an analysis of all the different possible components and various different ways to define, um, ways to take your basis. And this one seemed to be the most discriminative. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so after doing this comparison and looking at the images which actually match the data, we think that uh, M87 is a map. And uh, we can then extract from the images that pass interesting uh, quantities that we can take with us as we think about these larger scales. Uh, so here are histograms of the accretion rate and jet power here. Total intensity only is blue and uh, including these polarimetry constraints is red. So you can see, for example, uh, we now have a much better constraint on the accretion rate, if you believe our, our simulations. And uh, the, some interesting uh, things from this are that uh, the accretion rate is much less than one would expect from spherically symmetric inflow on parsec scales. That is, if you look at the x-ray profiles and estimate Bondi accretion, um, that accretion rate is actually orders of magnitude larger, uh, which is... Uh, troubling for many of us doing galaxy scale simulations where usually we, we are assuming bonding accretion. Uh, radiative efficiencies are all less than 1%, uh, which is what we expect for this, uh, these low Eddington ratio systems. And the jet powers uh, turn out to be somewhat small compared to larger scale requirements as well. Uh, if you compare, for example, uh, with low FAR, uh, the energy inferred required to blow up these lobes uh, turns out to be uh, about an order of magnitude, maybe more than that. Uh, but it's possible that we just happen to get lucky and catch M87 at a relatively quiet time uh, compared to its uh, mega year average and uh, allowed us uh, to capture the shadow. Maybe otherwise it would be too optically thick, for example. But we've only just begun tapping into the observables accessible to the EHT and uh, the upcoming NGEHT. This is a simulated model of Sagittarius star made by me. And so far what we have is the uh, total intensity and linear polarization at a single snapshot. Uh, but other data products that we'd like to produce include images of circular polarization, spectral index maps, that is uh, how the intensity is changing as a function of frequency, and rotation measure maps, that is uh, how the uh, ticks of the, of the polarization are moving as a function of lambda squared, where lambda is the wavelength. And uh, so, as you can see here, there's a lot of uh, 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 additional information that will be more constraining uh, on our models. Uh, and we, we'd, of course, also like to look into the time domain and produce movies of these things. So what I've been doing uh, in the past couple of years is uh, try and make predictions for each of these quantities uh, to see um, what we can learn about the, the physical systems from these observables. Let's start off with rotation measure. So uh, Faraday rotation is this process uh, where linear polarization is traveling through a magnetized plasma. When that happens, uh, the polarization orientation gets turned uh, by some angle uh, here marked beta, which is a function of interesting physical stuff, uh, electron temperature, uh, density, and magnetic field, and also lambda squared, uh, and where lambda is the wavelength. 
And now observers uh, like to compute this thing called RM, where you basically take a derivative with respect to lambda squared and isolate this interesting uh, physical part, uh, which, is, uh, which, which varies substantially in our models. What's really interesting about this is that uh, uh, rotation measure is sensitive to otherwise invisible cold electrons. Rotation measure is weak, or sorry, Faraday rotation is weaker in for, for relativistic electrons. And so this gives you some constraint into the population that actually isn't emitting and is absent from our images. And uh, we believe that uh, it's important uh, for uh, modifying the polarization in our models. So let's take a look at uh, one, one model here. This is a mad uh, high spinning model. And uh, what I like to do is uh, have the brightness of each pixel encode the intensity in that region and then color code by some quantity, in this case, the rotation measure, which is varying here uh, from uh, negative 10 to the 5 to positive 10 to the 5, uh, blue to red. Um, and it's interesting that uh, there are both blue and, uh, and red regions here. Uh, I wrote the vector B uh, in the previous slide because rotation measure is sensitive to the line of sight direction of the magnetic field. And uh, in this case, uh, it turns out that because of the turbulence in these flows, you can end up with uh, both uh, positive and negative RM regions. Uh, and if you have a spatially unresolved measurement, this can be uh, very confusing to interpret, uh, which is what's shown on the bottom there, uh, this value that is uh, jumping around really quickly and even changing sign. Uh, and this is a, a plot of, of what that looks like. You can see that uh, the autocorrelation time is uh, uh, pretty small, just days. Now, it turns out that the rotation measure of M87 has been varied across a week uh, during, has been measured across a week uh, with the, uh, at the same time as the EHT observations. And they also exhibit this rapid variability and a potential sign flip. Um, so this is a plausible uh, explanation of why this is happening. Curiously, Sag star, on the other hand, has exhibited a fixed sign uh, of the rotation measure for decades. Maybe that means that uh, uh, Faraday rotation is occurring at larger distances for that one. Can I ask you a question? If you look at the movie, there seems to be another ring there. Is this some sort of lensing feature or something? Do you mean like this inner ring? The one there is the dark thingy? Uh, mm -hmm. And then there is like this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so this big ring, that's the photon ring, that uh, uh, the unstable photon orbit. Um, the inner one there, uh, uh, we sometimes call the inner shadow. Um, and if you imagine a uh, geometrically thick disk that you're looking at face on, there's going to be some inner radius uh, where there's just going to be no disk there. Um, exactly uh, uh, where that is varies between the different models. I thought that there was not that much emission inside of the photon ring, but here there seems to be. It's, it's model dependent, actually. Yeah. So, um, so how do we know that uh, when we have the rotation major and whether or not that's coming from the galactic medium instead of uh, the uh, material around the supermassive black hole? The things that there are like these two components. Um, so, right. Uh, yeah. So how yeah. Um, and in, in the case of M87, this is a significant caveat. Um, because our polarization measurements uh, uh, are, when spatially unresolved, are sensitive to this extended jet emission as well. Um, we think that the rotation measure should be smaller. Uh, and uh, uh, we apparently don't need to invoke an additional source of Faraday rotation for M87. Um, it's uh, the, the uh, magnitude of that effect that we see is consistent with it all just happening uh, inside the emitting region. Can I ask, uh, the orientation angle is that major uncertainty because the whole thing is isometric. So how do you know the angle of inclination? Uh, so for M87, we can infer that from, from the jet. For Sag star, we don't know. And uh, uh, when modeling it, are, are typically agnostic to it. Well, uh, isn't there a significant uncertainty in the jet angle as well? I mean, Tiendra and, and HST. Uh, disagreed for many years. I don't know if this was ever satisfactorily <laughs> resolved at that level. Uh, so my understanding is that there's about a plus or minus five degree uncertainty at present. Um, I don't know about this historical disagreement.
All right. Uh, next, there's uh, also circular polarization. Uh, circular polarization can be generated through either direct emission from synchrotron that produces a little bit, about 1%, as well as Faraday conversion, uh, which is similar to Faraday rotation, but it exchanges linear and circular polarization states. Uh, circular polarization is also interesting because it can be used to constrain the plasma composition. The radiative transfer coefficients are a lot different if you have a, an electron-positron plasma versus if you have an ion-to-electron plasma. And that's something that uh, we're looking into with uh, with collaborators at the moment. Uh, you can see in this movie that's playing that uh, we've got a similar story to the RM that we've got both red and blue, both positive and negative circular polarization. Uh, but there's an interesting pattern I noticed for this one, which is that uh, sub images of subsequent order, uh, that is uh, the number of half orbits a photon makes around the black hole actually causes uh, the sign of your circular polarization to flip. And uh, we explain this as a, uh, a quirk of Faraday conversion plus parallel transport uh, having to do with the, uh, the geometry of the magnetic field and the fact that you're sourcing photons from the opposite side uh, of the accretion flow every time you, you increase the order. With the EHT, we're currently working on circularly polarized images. Uh, currently, there's only an upper limit for M87. Uh, Sag star is circularly polarized at about the 1% level, so maybe we'll be able to uh, have better luck there. Uh, but since circular polarization is uh, a lot smaller than, than linear, um, this is going to be a lot more challenging when creating images. Most recently, I've been looking into spectral index, which is the change in the intensity as you change the observing frequency. As you look at different frequencies, you probe different regions just due to varying optical depth. And uh, the animation on the left, shown by C.K. Chan, or made by C.K. Chan, shows that uh, you need to go down to about one millimeter uh, to see the shadow at, for this particular model. And as you go to higher and higher frequencies, the image gets smaller and smaller and also fainter. Uh, so I've been looking into spectral index maps in the vicinity of 230 gigahertz, the uh, operating frequency of the EHT, and uh, unpacking how this uh, is sensitive to the temperature density and magnetic fields. Interesting. Uh, Observational predictions include that uh, the photon ring again shows up very clearly here. It has the uh, most positive spectral index. And this is due to it having uh, the photons traveling through the plasma for longer. There's simply a longer path length. The optical depth is higher there. Uh, and they tend to also probe the um, uh, most, uh, the deepest regions where the magnetic field and temperature and density are all higher as well. And so we, we think there should be a radial decline. Uh, which is this, the same thing if you think about it as the uh, image getting smaller as you go to higher frequencies. Uh, this is what that looks like for a particular uh, same GRMHD snapshot. And uh, in this figure on the left, I'm actually showing you the same snapshot in GRMHD ray traced in different ways. Uh, I consider not only thermal electrons, uh, which is what we normally do for uh, these studies, but also a non-thermal electron distribution uh, where a, a high energy power law tail is characterized by this value of kappa. And uh, this is a kappa distribution, if you're familiar with this. And uh, the lower kappa is, the more, uh, the larger fraction of the electrons are, are uh, in this high energy tail. It's been shown before that that can make your image a lot bigger. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, even the unresolved spectral index, which is plotted here, uh, uh, exhibits a lot of variation among the models. Uh, here we've got MADs on the left, SANs on the right, uh, and uh, different uh, electron distribution functions are the different rows. The y-axis is also different here. The MADs actually, they for whatever reason, we don't fully understand yet, uh, tend not to vary so much as a function of these free parameters. Uh, but uh, the SANs uh, uh, have uh, a lot more variability here. Does it tell us anything about acceleration mechanism? Uh, yeah, so if, if one is able to connect the uh, acceleration mechanism to a particular value of kappa, for example, which I don't know much, much about, um, then one could, in principle, uh, infer something about the electron mechanisms there. So the parallel tail, that part is that the index is more like, uh, what's kind of index of the parts? Uh, so the, the index that, that I use is uh, 
It's kappa plus one, I believe. Uh, minus one. Minus one. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, at uh, at large energies. Uh, now the the EHT is going to continue to develop, and uh, there's an ongoing project called the NGEHT uh, or Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope, uh, which is dreaming big, as you can see here. Uh, this is a plot from uh, Raymond et al. 2021, and uh, current EHT sites are shown in blue. The uh, proposed uh, candidate sites, uh, not all of which will actually be be used, are shown in red here. And the idea is to have a larger bandwidth for increased signal to noise and frequency studies, more frequencies for complementary images probing different regions of the flow, uh, potentially also stations in space, although maybe that'll be the NNGEHT, uh, which would uh, increase the baseline length to and uh, uh, enable uh, higher resolution images and uh, uh, higher cadence movies if you're not waiting for the Earth to rotate and instead have something in low Earth orbit that's moving around quicker. We're hoping that uh, we'll be able to produce uh, uh, a big upgrade from the still image you've seen before, something more like this. Uh, this is a simulation by Andrew Shale, and then simulated image reconstruction by a version of the NGEHT by Lindy Blackburn on the right. And to me, they look uh, pretty indistinguishable. Uh, time in years is playing, uh, is shown on the top left. So uh, the idea is that if we're able to harness all of these telescopes multiple times a year, uh, we'd be able to make movies like this, probing not only the inner accretion flow, but also these large scale jet structures, which at present are resolved out by the EHT. We need more short baselines. Notice also that this is now log scale. Um, so we, we expect a, a great improvement in dynamic range. One thing I've been doing very recently is uh, trying to make predictions for what uh, NGEHT uh, ought to tell us about the physics. Uh, I've started out with uh, GRMHD simulations run by Ramesh Narayan, and then uh, been doing the ray tracing. We now have nine different spins uh, uh, instead of only five. And I'm looking at four frequencies, four values of this R high parameter, and uh, uh, both thermal and non-thermal electrons as well. Uh, you can see two examples here. Uh, the different panels are different frequencies. We have a mat on top, a sane on the bottom. And typically, the images get smaller with increasing frequency. Images also get more asymmetric with increasing frequency, and more so for the probe rates. Um, and uh, exactly teasing out uh, the different rates of change for these, uh, for these different models is something that I'd like to do. All right, now we're going to zoom out uh, with the time I have left uh, to think about black holes and their connections with galaxies. Uh, my simulations of choice to do this are the Romulus cosmological simulations. And uh, take a look at uh, the resolution here. We've now zoomed out by many orders of magnitude. Uh, for M87, about 1,000 uh, gravitational radii is about uh, uh, 0.3 parsecs. Uh, and uh, yeah, more work needs to be done to connect these different scales. Uh, but with a simulation like this, uh, you can probe uh, the connection between black holes and their galaxies and even their intergalactic environment, whether or not we think that this is important. What's nice about these simulations are that they have realistic seeding uh, that's based on local gas properties. Uh, many simulations of this class will tend to just put a black hole in any halo that exceeds a certain mass threshold. Um, but this one is uh, looks at the gas particles and uh, puts them in, in a scenario that's roughly uh, consistent with uh, a heavy seeding uh, process. These also have realistic dynamics uh, where the black holes are not pinned to the centers of galaxies, which is again often done, but rather allowed to move uh, with dynamics corrected for missing dynamical friction, which is uh, uh, something that gets lost uh, when you have limited gravitational resolution. And there's also a large dynamic range in halo mass by combining uh, Romulus 25, which is a field simulation and Romulus C, uh, which is a galaxy cluster. And so the, uh, the virial radius of this galaxy cluster is about a megaparsec. So that's the megaparsec uh, in my title. Uh, this one is actually a little on the small side, uh, 10 to the minus 10 to the 14 solar masses. Uh, Coma and Virgo are, are more like we think 10 to the 15 instead. And with a simulation like this, 
Uh, one thing that uh, I wanted was uh, to determine what it is that sets the black hole accretion rate um, if we are able to know something about the galaxy. And the best relation that I could find was that the black hole accretion rate followed the star formation rate in these galaxies. Uh, this is shown here. Uh, and observationally, this was called the AGN main sequence by Milady et al. 2012, um, looking at, at star forming galaxies at redshift of one. Uh, and that's the, the gray band here. Uh, each of these points is a galaxy uh, with a black hole in the Romulus simulations uh, in the field case. And you can see that they actually land right on that line, uh, independent of, of redshift here, shown here on the, on the top of each panel. Uh, it, not only is it independent of redshift, uh, it's also independent of uh, environment. Uh, this was the field. Uh, this one is the cluster. Uh, now, this is as long as you restrict yourself to star-forming galaxies. And uh, it turns out that galaxy mergers actually have no notice effect, noticeable effect on the accretion rate in this model as well. Uh, and this is pointing towards a picture where uh, the intergalactic environment is actually not doing much uh, to, uh, to set the black hole's fueling rate, uh, which is a uh, uh, something that uh, remains controversial, both observationally and theoretically. Uh, but in cosmological simulations like this, uh, I don't think there's a single one that uh, says that galaxy mergers are the dominant or sole source of uh, uh, efficient black hole activity. But do you see the enhancement of, uh, for example, bar formation during an active merger? Uh, sorry, what was the question? Bar in the galaxy, do you see the merger can enhance the bar? Oh, uh, that's not something that I looked into. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That can enhance, for example, the creation and self formation efficiency. Right. Um, so I, I looked at uh, uh, average Eddington ratios uh, following galaxy mergers, and uh, overall didn't, didn't see any trends no matter how I cut the data. Uh, we could talk about that later if you want. But what, there was what physical one, mechanism did you use for accretion? Is it like something more sophisticated than Bondi? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's Bondi with a, a little modification to account for the angular momentum of, of nearby gas. Uh, but yes, that that is uh, probably the biggest uncertainty when I talk about uh, accretion rates in these in these simulations. Uh, but yeah, this remains pretty standard uh, within the cosmological simulation community, unfortunately. Now, in the galaxy cluster simulation, there was a case where environment did matter. And this is something that I noticed at the end of these galaxies lifetimes. Uh, here, we're looking at three examples. We've got the specific star formation rate in blue, black hole accretion rate in red, and uh, we're moving forward in time here. And what I noticed for many of these galaxies as they were falling into the cluster, um, you would see this uh, peak in the black hole activity and then both the star formation rate and the black hole activity would decrease. And it turns out that this correlates with uh, this property, this uh, quantity here in orange, which is the galaxy's incident ramp pressure from the intercluster medium. Um, and so uh, uh, this is what uh, those galaxies actually look like in terms of gas at these uh, times marked by vertical dashed lines. Uh, we believe that galaxies falling into a cluster like this experience ram pressure stripping, which is important for uh, evolving their morphologies and colors. Uh, it'll turn a spiral galaxy into a quenched lenticular or elliptical galaxy. And uh, you can see here that it operates from the outside in, moving, removing first the, most, the least bound gas on the outskirts and leaving behind uh, um, smaller and smaller uh, tails of gas. These are evocatively sometimes called jellyfish galaxies in the observational community. And looking, looking at these uh, with uh, uh, results spectroscopy, um, Portianti et al. found an excess of AGN in the ram, in ram pressure strip galaxies like this. This triggering is not yet understood. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, we, are, we were able to study in these simulations. It happened pretty much to all of the galaxies that I was able to look at in the cluster. Uh, it seems like uh, there might be actually a synergy between black hole activity and ram pressure stripping at the end of their lives. Uh, because as prescribed in the simulation, when these black holes accrete, um, 
they will drive a hot outflow uh, based on the feedback prescription. And it turns out that that acts on the gas, which is most difficult for ramp pressure stripping to operate on, that which is deepest in the potential well. Probably this happens to see black holes based on local gas properties, not galaxy or halo properties. So it turned out that there were two very similar galaxies, one with a black hole and one without, that we could use as a case study here. They had very similar masses, uh, uh, 10 to the uh, 10.3, both of them, and um, very, very similar orbits. Uh, their uh, incident ramp pressure as a function of time, you could barely see it, is a, is a dotted line here, and they're mostly the same. Uh, but the one in blue has no black hole, one in red does. Uh, if we look uh, at these points marked by this vertical line, take a, a slice uh, in the gas and look at, make a temperature map. The one without a black hole looks pretty normal. We've got a, a disk here and a hotter halo. Uh, whereas the one with a black hole had triggered this, this uh, AGN event and is driving a, an, a hot outflow from the center. Uh, now, the one without a black hole, if you look at the specific star formation rate, takes giga years to quench, uh, whereas the one with a black hole, um, perhaps due to this outflow here, rapidly quenches um, within a giga year. Such signatures of feedback have also been observed uh, in this one nice face on galaxy uh, in the jellyfish galaxy sample um, by George et al. 2019. If you make a, a map that uh, encodes the cold gas content, as well as uh, uh, whether or not there is an AGN uh, based on spectral lines. You can see a cavity of cold gas uh, where um, AGN activity is evident. Most recently, uh, I've been looking into dynamics. Uh, now, between the galaxy merger and black hole merger, there can be significant delays, um, not only on parsec scales, if you've heard of the final parsec problem, uh, but also on uh, galactic scales. And uh, this can occur uh, simply because the intergalactic environment in a realistic simulation is not uh, your typical uh, idealized spherical potential. Uh, and in addition, sometimes the mass of your black hole is simply just too small for the uh, black holes to merge within a Hubble time. Whether or not and when black holes merge directly affects gravitational wave event rates, and the mass assembly of the most massive black holes, as well as something we call the Sultan argument, which connects uh, observed quasar activity to uh, black hole mass density. Uh, and so um, we decided to look into this uh, missing, observationally missing population uh, to see its effects on, uh, on black hole demographics overall. Uh, now, uh, in this plot, uh, I'm showing you first uh, the average number of centrals uh, central black holes as a function of halo mass uh, on top, and uh, then log of the average number of wandering black holes on the bottom. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's nice that even though Romulus actually knows nothing about global halo properties, uh, it reproduces uh, the observed occupation fraction estimated indirectly by the x-rays uh, nicely well. Uh, we uh, it's, it'd be unsurprising if there's a decline if you go to dwarf, dwarf galaxies. Uh, sometimes these dwarf galaxies don't even have a nucleus where you would even look for a black hole. But this is uh, theoretically and observationally uncertain. Uh, so this uh, plateaus to one, uh, where most massive galaxies have a, a black hole at the center. Uh, but the number of wanderers actually scales linearly with the halo mass. Uh, so while the Milky Way, according to these simulations, should have about 10 of these, uh, the main halo of the cluster simulation has about 2,000. Uh, wanderers uh, vastly outnumber the centrals. And it turns out they were even dominant in terms of total black hole mass uh, out at redshift of four, uh, suggesting that uh, um, this would be a significant correction to the Sultan argument. Um, this is what this would look like. Uh, so uh, our in this uh, two times 10 to the 12 solar mass halo, we've got about 15. Dwarf galaxy has a couple. This uh, central uh, uh, group galaxy has 241. Uh, and you can see that they're moving around in a pretty disordered fashion. And there's no obvious uh, stellar counterparts to these. I also looked in the particle data to, to check if there was a resolved stellar component around these and uh, typically found none. What's the distribution of the masses of it? Did you put some cut or? Uh, I, I did not put any cut on those. Um, 
we don't make strong statements about the masses that because they tend to stay near the seed mass of the simulation, which is a 10 to the 6. Uh, a proxy that I use is the accreted portion of the mass. So if you subtract the black hole seed mass, uh, again, that would suggest that these are in the uh, intermediate mass black hole uh, regime. Um, yeah, so typically these are coming from uh, strict dwarf galaxies that were satellites and have a minor merger. The satellite gets destroyed, leaving behind this black hole. Maybe in reality, there would also be some more compact stellar component that's not resolved in the simulation. Um, these wandering black holes uh, could potentially shine, again, with the big caveat that this is Bondi accretion. <laughs> if one uh, uh, takes the accretion rates, assumes, as one usually does, a radiative efficiency of 10%, and in this case, also 10% of the flux getting emitted in the X-ray, uh, this is one galaxy which would break up into, uh, in fact, uh, five sources, each with a volumetric luminosity above 10 to the 42 uh, ergs per second. Uh, in this case. Um, and uh, if one were stacking a bunch of galaxies, it's possible that this uh, contribution can actually uh, exceed uh, the X-rays produced from uh, X-ray binaries, according to these simulations. Uh, one thing we realized as well, uh, and this may be a... a Sorry, um, why did you say you, you were stacking them? I didn't mean that. Why do you... Oh, so... Yeah, as, as a potential way of detecting these, um, we uh, were proposing that one might stack a bunch of galaxies of, of similar mass on top of each other in the X-ray. And then you could get uh, a halo of X-ray emission um, that would be wider than just uh, the AGN at the center involved with the, the beam of, of Chandra, for example. But whether or not these are uh, more uh, luminous than all the X-ray binaries, that's independent of the stacking thing. Zero torus. That's right. Yeah. And what's the ratio that you expect between uh, X-ray binaries and these? Yeah. I, so I was getting uh, about an order of magnitude. Um, de it depends on the halo mass and redshift. Um, but uh, yeah, in uh, Milky Way mass uh, halos, uh, they were typically an order of magnitude above. Uh, big caveat again. This is Bondi with <laughs> simple uh, prescriptions for uh, emission. So this would be an order of magnitude more than the X-ray binaries. Yes. But also, they, they are, they, they are much fewer sources, right? So some sort of Poisson noise or some shape you could distinguish. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is counting uh, some as well that, are, that might actually be obviously dual AGN, and you would take them out of your sample. Um, so yeah, it depends on one's uh, observing strategy. So for these wandering black holes, will they fall back to the center like due to dynamical friction very fast? Uh, not necessarily. Yeah. So certainly the one, since most of these are near the seed mass, uh, 10 to the six solar masses. I mean, mo yeah. So what I, what I showed you before was, was redshift of, uh, of 0.05. Uh, I didn't go to lower redshift because there was actually some bug in terms of <laughs> linking black holes to, to their pillows. Um, and so, uh, yeah, within a Hubble time, these are, these are sticking around. All right. Um, yeah, one thing we realized, uh, and which uh, uh, may, may arguably be less uncertain <laughs> than the uh, accretion rates from Bondi accretion, is that uh, if we take these uh, results at face value, wandering tidal disruption events uh, could potentially outnumber central ones. The theoretical TDE rate comes from counting central black holes, or rather counting galaxies and assuming some uh, relationship between um, black holes and, and their galaxies. Uh, but as you go lower in mass, um, mo more and more of these uh, black holes of a given mass are in the wandering regime. Uh, so this plot is showing the fraction of black holes of a given mass, which are centrally located in their galaxy. And uh, the seed mass, again, is 10 to the 6, to remind you. So this, this last uh, bin is most uncertain. Uh, these ones grew by at least a factor of 2 uh, from their initial masses. So I, I believe those masses more. But the point is that uh, below 10 to the 7, uh, your typical black hole is actually not something like Sagittarius star at the center of a galaxy, but something wandering 
uh, the halo of uh, some other galaxy coming from uh, a minor merger that had uh, destroyed the original host. At present, there's uh, one convincing offset TDE candidate that I'm aware of, uh, Lynn et al. 2018. Uh, it has a tiny uh, counterpart uh, in stars and uh, this nice uh, T to the minus 5 thirds power law, which is characteristic of a TDE. Uh, but uh, this requires that uh, uh, there, these things need, need to have retained some stellar component to disrupt. Um, and uh, we are uh, making this leap assumes that uh, they are disrupting stars from say an unresolved nuclear star cluster at a similar rate. Uh, we're working with uh, Nick Stone to make a more robust predictions for the overall TDE rate here. Um, yeah, so as I predicted, I don't have time for semi-analytic model stuff, uh, but uh, if uh, you'd like to chat with me about that, I, I made some predictions for next generation luminosity functions and gravitational wave event rates. Uh, this technique is great for, for tackling the seeding problem, uh, but I'll skip ahead to uh, my conclusion slide. So exciting uh, black hole science occurs across many scales. Now resolved uh, imaging with the event horizon telescope is able to constrain models of the central engine. There's a lot to learn from polarimetry, the time domain and improved imaging in the future. Meanwhile, you can use cosmological simulations to link black holes to their galaxies in realistic environments. In Romulus, it turns out that the black holes and stars usually grow together without much effect of the intergalactic environment, except uh, during this uh, ram pressure stripping phase, uh, which most people aren't thinking about. Many black holes ought to be wandering throughout galactic halos. Uh, it's possible to detect them as offset accretors, uh, a diffuse halo of emission, uh, or potentially offset TDEs, which we'd like to look into in more detail. And uh, if you're interested in chatting with me about SAMs later, they're great for tying everything together. And uh, it's possible to distinguish seeding models with gravitational wave event distributions and luminosity functions. So thank you. I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Angela. Angela is stay here today and tomorrow. So if you want to chat more, you can sign up on the sheet. So you're saying that the ramp pressure has a big uh, effect, but mergers don't. So uh, is that the conflict with other simulations or what? So what happens during mergers? You don't trigger much star formation or in the end? Uh, you, you do tend, so in Romulus, there, there is a visible increase in the star formation rate, not very dramatic. Um, and uh, yeah, in, the, in that case, uh, the black holes uh, will, will stay on, on that line as, uh, as the star formation rate increases, uh, the black hole accretion rate will also increase. But it's, yeah, not, there's a lot of scatter in that relation already. It's not very, not very clear. So the total uh, like merger triggered star formation is a small fraction of the overall star formation. I'm, I'm not sure that anyone has quantified that in, in, in any way in Romulus, um, but intuitively, Perhaps. Uh, so, is there any like physical reason like why M87 uh, should be mad instead of a saint? So, is there any other like, physical reason why they, its center becomes mad? Uh, so, the mad limit is uh, uh, can be thought of as similar to the Eddington limit, but for magnetic fields. Uh, as you keep uh, trying to push magnetic flux onto a black hole. Uh, it'll eventually saturate at some value. Turns out to uh, vary a little bit uh, within the factor of two uh, between different simulations. Um, but uh, once you get to this this mad state, uh, you uh, my yeah postdoc advisor Ramesh uh, likes to say that uh, this is this sh it theoretically seems like it would be an end state and that everything would would end up like this. So so I wonder whether the polarization observation would. Uh due to the resolution projection effect would make it look more older than it is, the magnetic field structure, do you think? Uh, certainly there is, uh, these, these simulations predict that there should be more tangles on, mm -hmm. on smaller scales. You could even see that from mm -hmm. uh, that one plot somewhere, here it is. Uh, although in an individual pixel, you may not necessarily trust what's going on there because uh, it's uh, just a, a single geodesic it's not actually a spatially resolved pixel mm -hmm. um, but there yeah there could be uh, 
more substructure there um, that an improved uh, NGDHT could potentially do that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the X-ray sources, people have been looking at ULXs now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. People have also been quantifying better and better the relationship between the uh, X-ray emission, diffuse emission from X-ray binaries and distant galaxies and star formation rate. I mean, these relationships are very well known at this point. I mean, I, I feel like if there was an excess over an order of magnitude, if, we, if there were a lot of ULXs that were not explained by, well, so then the big development was that uh, many nearby ULXs were convincingly demonstrated to be Shabredington um, neutron star creators. So I, I feel like there's a lot of observational constraints already in this area that an order of magnitude enhancement due to wandering black holes just would not seem to me like as plausible anymore. Do you have a feeling for how you can violate the current constraints? Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I'd be, first of all, interested in, in learning more about, uh, about those. Um, one thing that uh, might help the scenario is that uh, uh, I would imagine that uh, if you had AGN signatures, one would reject that from your sample. Um, but uh, as, a, as a theoretician, I don't know too much about that. Um, and yeah, again, this is all Bondi accretion, so right. is uh, uh, quite that, possible. That could well be the most significant factor, indeed. Yeah, so that would be why um, the luminosity is overpredicted. Yeah. Any other question here at online? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we already had a lot of nice discussion and uh, thank Angela again for this very comprehensive informative talk. So thank you.